Um, now, tonight's event, I'm really pleased, I'm really excited to be talking shortly with Mark Hignett, who is the curator at Oswestry Town Museum. And many of you, I'm sure, will recall the first uh, presentation he did for the Shrewsbury History Festival in 2017. And this evening, we're going to catch up on that and find out what has happened in the last four years. First, though, uh, we'll see a little video about one of the amazing projects, and that's just one to come out of the Soldiers in Love story. Then I'll do a brief resume of the podcast made from Mark's talk, because we appreciate, you know, best will in the world you mean to click on a link and, and listen, but you just don't get to it. So I'll do as quick as I can resume, eh? and then we'll move into questions uh, and uh, Mark will try and answer them, or we both will. Uh, and do remember to use the Q&A function on your screen, usually at the bottom of the screen. And you can do that at any time, so don't feel you need to wait if something occurs to you. But anyway, we're now just going to go, as I say, to a short uh, video of one of the um, projects that came out of Soldiers in Love. Love is in the air at this Shrewsbury nursing home. 76-year-old Maureen is reading a letter she wrote to her late husband Clive in 1961, the year after they were married. Just a short note to say how much I love you as always. It is so nice we both love each other and hope it will remain as always. Love and kisses as always, Mo. Treasured memories, but hours after, Maureen's 56-year-old letter was burned with her consent. She was lending her support to an arts project in Oswestry. People are being encouraged to write love letters and burn them in this memorial flame. The ash will be made into a diamond and set into a ring to be displayed at the town museum. The intention was to create this artwork, this diamond, through this destructive process, this burning of people's love letters, literally so that the diamond is made up of the very fabric of people's love and that it therefore reflects the diversity of love felt in 2017. I've written it to my best friend who um, has really helped me through really dark times as well. It is private but I'm happy to share it. It's a love letter to our gay son. I wrote it to my mum. Um, who died 10 years ago and I just wanted to say that I miss her in my life and everything I am today I am because of her. Funded by lottery money to coincide with this weekend's Heritage Open Days, the project has been inspired by World War II soldiers Gilbert Bradley and Gordon Bowsher. They were lovers but convention forced them to be secretive. The town's museum acquired hundreds of their love letters recently. They've now become a springboard for people to express their deepest emotions. Bob Hockenall, BBC Midlands Today, Shropshire. As I said, we'll have a few questions and answers with Mark in a minute, and I'll just do a resume now of what I recall as the main things that Mark was saying um, four years ago. Now, one of the immediate things um, Mark said was about setting up the Oswestry Town Museum and the requirement in doing that and getting support was to tell the story of Oswestry through its people. And you went on to say that in honouring that, you made a wide ranging search on eBay for all things Oswestry and found in doing that, uh, initially three letters addressed to a soldier called Gilbert who was in training in the early years of World War II at Park Hall Camp, which was a massive military camp near Oswestry during World War II. Now, the letters were from the soldier's mum and his dad, and it seemed also the third one was from his fiancée. And that third letter was signed as being from your ever-loving G. So what you had was a neat fragment for a picture of life for a soldier at Park Hall at that time. However, being Mark, um, his interest was piqued because someone else was trying to buy letters as well at the same time and not to be outdone and not to, uh, and to cut a long story short, over 18 months, I think you bought about a thousand letters. That's an astronomical sum. No, that's a joke. Um, thousand letters. 
um, and you were reading the letters and getting a fuller picture of Gilbert's life uh, as the letters were coming in, not in date order. So it was a bit of a jigsaw to piece together. And then came a moment with one of the letters, which you referred to as the big reveal. And this is where G referred to himself in one of the letters as Gordon. So not Gilbert's fiance. And you realize that the letters were telling of a love affair between two men. Now, this was a, a case where there were two men in love at a time when to be so was potentially a criminal assent, a criminal offense. And if discovered, could certainly at the very least, uh, notwithstanding criminal prosecution, lead to a dishonorable discharge from the forces. Now, at this point, I'd just like to mention that in the audience today, we are really delighted to have Craig Jones and Caroline Page, who are the joint chief executives of an organization called Fighting with Pride. And they have been tirelessly fighting for reparations for all service personnel dishonorably discharged from the services simply because they were gay. So I'm so pleased they're here and I hope that may stimulate some discussion because this could have been a very different story, either or both of Gilbert or Gordon could have been discharged. But more on that later. Back to the letters. Mark realised that what he had was a wealthy store of information about the lives of Gilbert Bradley and Gordon Bowsher and a wonderful picture of um, a slice of life at that time. There were a couple in love who met in Devon in the summer of 1938. They met up and spent nights together in Shrewsbury and had very interesting lives when they were together and also when they were apart, um, hobnobbing as well along the way with gay celebrities uh, of the time. Another interesting factor, they explored very honestly in their letters, their what you might call today an open relationship and their plans to be together after the war. Gordon's letters are full of honour full of humour, I should say, and social interests. And he's clear um, in the letters that he doesn't want to hide their love. And in one letter he says that he wants all the world to know of it. By the end of the war, you said you knew they had in fact separated. Gilbert settling eventually in Brighton, a successful man who among many other things published a book, uh, very polished, book about porcelain and Gordon settled in California running a successful stud farm. Um, you conclude by saying how the letters affected you personally and how they have a way of making people just really want to know more. So before we get into questions that will be coming in, um, one of the questions I had for you Mark was just if you could say a little bit more about how the discovery of these letters um, change things for you? Because I think you said you wouldn't have thought specifically about LGBT people and how the museum would tell the story of Oslo Street through its people. So how did the change happen? Hi Peter. Um, well, it came gradually through the discovery of, of what the letters contained. Um, I mean, if the letters had been advertised, for example, as being the story of, of a, an LGBT relationship, uh, I probably wouldn't have bought them because I was looking for traditional items for a museum. But having bought them and then discovered what they were about completely opened my eyes and the other volunteers at the museum to the fact uh, that there were LGBTQ plus relationships in the area going on in the past years and that they should be recorded and reported in the museum. Uh, and we have, as, as you now know, a permanent Gilbert and Gordon uh, display. Uh, we've had people come specifically to visit it from all over the country. And of course, uh, one of the projects that you just featured that we did with the ink to ash to diamond, um, we still get inquiries all the time. But for me personally, I come from a generation that uh, I think, uh, uh, being completely open and honest was that uh, okay there were gay people about and we knew about it and I knew some friends of mine that were gay but nobody talked about it and as long as it went on be, you know behind closed doors that was fine um, but there wasn't any um, attempt to bring it out into the open well these letters make you want to know more they make you want to be uh, inquisitive about what went on particularly as you said because they're so open and they and 
uh, the letters describe who they met, where they went, um, um, what other people were involved. They, they talk about George Armitage uh, and uh, Ivan Novello, um, who invited them back to his drinking room after a show. So the social history of it is really fascinating and it just makes everybody want to know more. And for my own personal reason, it's completely opened my perception um, of, of love in all its various forms. Yes, and I think for me, you know, I used to think that it was the 60s and the 70s where there were kind of an opening out of what relationships were and what they could be. And I remember you telling in the talk about how um, I think it was a mutual friend of Gilbert and Gordon who introduced um, Gilbert to Gordon at the party down in Devon that he was invited to. And this chap was actually in a relationship with Gordon, but nonetheless said, come on, come on, Gilbert, you'll really like Gordon. And here he is sort of offering Gilbert his boyfriend. So very puzzling. Yeah, it was, uh, and it's quite strange because um, um, Phil, who was uh, Gordon's boyfriend at the time, was a distant cousin of Gilbert's. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, he wrote to Gilbert and said, you've always wanted to know Gordon. Well, now's your chance. Come down because we've rented a houseboat. And he actually says in the letter, I know that when you two meet up, I shall become nothing but a back number. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that, <laughs> that's really amazing that you would, that you would do that. Um, yeah. And that's how it started. And the other interesting thing is that we thought that Phil wrote to Gilbert. Well, at that time, Gilbert was a rep on the road for Cadbury's. So Phil actually sent the letter inviting Gilbert to this houseboat party to Cadbury's who forwarded it to Gilbert who was on the road in time for him to go to Devon the next weekend I mean that tells you something about the postal service in those days mm. so yeah so there's again the social history uh, and and the openness with how they talk is uh, absolutely fascinating and it, and it makes everything um, come out into the open mm. Uh, another question that I've been asked is, um, do you know why? I mean, it's such a lovely relationship from the letters, um, amazing letters, but nonetheless, uh, you know, as you said, the, the, they separate. Do you have any idea exactly when and why, why the separation? Why did they not live happily ever after, say, in California or wherever? Well, we know that they were planning to go to California because uh, in one letter, um, uh, Gilbert says he was talking to his mum and his mum had said uh, ab about them going to California and then his mum, Gilbert's mum, said to Gordon, you must bring Tim, because that was Gilbert's nickname, to see me before you go. So Gilbert's mum was well aware they were going. We've got the letter that put them together, as we've just said. We haven't got the breakup letter. I haven't got any letter that actually specifically says, that's it, we're finished. Uh, we do know that it was in late 1941, early 1942, uh, but we don't know exactly why. Uh, we do know that Gilbert had had a, a couple of affairs while he was posted to Scotland. Uh, and they discussed this quite openly in the letters. And in fact, one of the strangest things from my point of view that Gordon says is, can you tell me whether you were unfaithful uh, spiritually or physically? Because if it was spiritually, and he sort of hints I can put up with it if it was spiritually, but if it was physically, then I'll have to think again. So the only thing that I can think is that they just, um, Gilbert having been away, they, ju they just separated. Mm. We don't actually know why. We know that Gilbert stayed in this country and, and Gordon went to America settled in California and became a naturalized American. Mm. Yes, because one of my sort of assumptions, which may well be completely wrong, was that after the war, the situation for gay men certainly, uh, and others, tightened with Maxwell Fife then as the Home Secretary. And whereas perhaps there'd been a little bit more breathing space during the Second World War, um, the number of arrests straight after the war of gay men just went right up again. So I wondered whether that was part of it or whether it was just a relationship. They were, I can't remember how old they were, Mark. But they, they, were, they were in their um, third, late 20s, 30s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think, I don't think that would have affected their relationship because, yeah. of course, they broke up in 1941, 1942. So it, before the end of the war. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And we have no letters from Gordon after 1942, unless, of course, there is another batch of letters that we haven't 
Scott, but I yeah. don't think so because they sort of peter out on this, um, uh, this, these, this, these thoughts about Gilbert having had an affair in Scotland. Mm. Can you just say a little bit? A uh, question I've had in is um, how the person you bought the letters from? Any idea how they came by them? This right, cat. the person I the person I bought the letters off is a military mail specialist. Right. And these letters were, of course, were addressed to Gunnar Gilbert Bradley, so they they would be classed as military mail. And I originally thought that the people um, who were asked to clear Gilbert's house when he passed away um, must have contacted him. But I've since learned that the people who cleared his house actually had a clearance sale, an auction at the property. So I don't yet know whether he went down or whether they contacted him, but the military mailman uh, bought the majority of the letters. There right. were some that he didn't get, which is what I refer to as the lost collection. Ah, right. So do you want to say a little bit more now about the lost collection? What is uh, it? I can do, yeah, because it, <laughs> this, is something that's happened. <laughs> this is something that's happened since the podcast, of course. Um, in uh, 2018, I received a phone call one afternoon from a gentleman that had got hold of me through my contact details at the museum. And the conversation went something like this. Um, Are you the guy that's um, interested in the Gilbert Bradley letters? And I said, yes. And he said, would you like some more? So I said, well, yeah, I'd love some more. And he, I said, but send me some pictures because what I thought he might have done is gone on the internet, taken photocopies of all of the stuff that's available, put it in a folder, and then was offering to sell me the stuff I'd already got. Anyway, he sent me some photographs and I realized it was stuff I hadn't got. So the conversation, <clears throat> excuse me, then went, um, well, if you're interested in them and you pay me what I'm asking for them, I won't put them up for auction. Mm. So he gave me a price, I agreed it, and I bought them. And what I've got, I, I brought it so that I can just show you the folder tonight. They were all in a folder, and it's called it's called Gilbert Bradley History. And it's a wow. red folder wow. like that. Wow. And inside, I can show you a little bit inside. Oh, we're are, uh, <laughs> some letters, pieces of paper. Um, there's an invitation from Dame Elizabeth Cadbury for Gilbert to go for afternoon tea at her home. Um, and there are some letters from Gordon. I'll be honest, I haven't looked at it yet uh, because I've had so much uh, other stuff that I've been doing. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> but there is a letter there from Gordon, which is very interesting. Um, and Gordon writes to Gilbert and says, I've been talking to Sir Harold Bolton. And Sir Harold Bolton was in RAF intelligence. And he said, I've been talking to Sir Harold Bolton, and he was the first person to interview Rudolf Hess when he flew into Scotland. Now, everything to do with Rudolf Hess, as far as I can find out, is still um, under the Secrets Act. Um, and you can't find Sir Harold Bolton linked with Rudolf Hess. So I hope I don't get into trouble for saying this, but Gordon wrote to Gilbert and said, don't believe what you read in the papers. I've been talking to Sir Harold Bolton. Um, he's the first person who interviewed Rudolf Hess, and he's told me the real story. Gosh. And did you know, by the way, that when Rudolf Hess was taken to hospital to be checked over, they found that he'd got scarlet painted toenails? I mean, the, the, the most inane things that they talk about in these letters, but yeah. it's, it's such an interesting fact that, you know, yes. I haven't found it reported anywhere else. Yeah. Has all this, I've got a question here from Sal saying, does this mean since um, all of this, as well as the Gilbert and Gordon story, the soldiers in love, which must have taken a huge amount of your time and the museum's energy, but overall, are you still actively looking for LGBT stories that reflect Oswestry in different ways? Yes. Yes, definitely. I mean, we would welcome anybody that's got a, a story to tell to contact the museum and we'll feature it in our display. Or if they don't want it right. to feature, we, we can do it anonymously. Yes, no problem at all. We would love that. We now think that every museum should have an, should have an LGBT section. Right. Or yeah. display rather, not section. Yeah. Yeah, because a thing we occasionally get in the, in the history group from some of the museums around the county otherwise and elsewhere is 
Well, yeah, okay, but how would we recognise it? Have you got any advice for them? Well, I didn't recognise it when it came, so that, 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 that's a bit of a sticky one. It, 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 it's really, I think, that, that by reaching out and talking to people and perhaps talking to groups. I mean, I uh, um, only came on this story because, uh, I mean, you know, I was driving to the museum and heard you on Radio Shropshire yeah. uh, asking for LGBT stories. And I, as a response to that, contacted Radio Shropshire. So I think yeah. by reaching out and by doing what you're doing now, yeah. um, the History Month, I think br keep, brings it to everybody's attention. And we keep it very much alive in Oswestry, Street. Yes. Um, and we keep the Gilbert and Gordon story very much alive. Yes, it, interesting you say that because we've reached, recently had the Ambridge Gorge Museum re reach out to us saying they've got something interesting to say about A.E. Hausman, who apparently his grandfather lived in Culp. Culbert, Culbert yeah. Hall. So, so yeah, we'll see where that goes. You mentioned Cabris. Another question coming in is, um, um, you, you mentioned in your talk in 2017 about the little film that um, uh, Gilbert was in. Is it possible to see that anywhere? Maybe on the new website that you've created or, or is that possible? Right, we've done it. We, we are at this moment, we've commissioned a brand new website for the museum and there will be a full um, Gilbert and Gordon section uh, on the website with its own page. With a, and I wanted to ask you about a copy of the podcast as well right. and the various other bits and pieces. Um, and so, yes, I will look to try and get it on there. I haven't actually seen the film myself yet, um, but I know that we've got a copy of it on a memory stick in the museum that right. somebody got for us in Cadbury St. Fortress. I haven't actually seen it myself. It's a, a film, I think, explaining about the difficulties of getting cocoa in, in the, uh, when the restrictions were on. But yes, certainly that would be a, a, a something we would want to do. And any chance of any images of, of um, Gordon? Do we have any? No, we've been unsuccessful. We have searched a high, low and level for... Uh, pictures of Gordon we can't even find it and we've, we've tracked in California and I know that you did um, quite a lot of research in California and there's plenty of documents about um, what he did but no photographs of him and I can't find any over here as well and unfortunately there were none in Gilbert's um, letters. Mm. It's, it's, it's frustrating isn't it because we have this I think many people have this sort of iconic image now Gilbert but they can't put a Gordon next to him. But no, one but we've, day, got Gordon's, one day. we've got Gordon's naturalisation papers, so we yes. know that Gordon was yes. six foot two, blonde haired, blue eyed. Yes. So, yeah. And that's as far as we can go. Yeah. Um, another question is about the, the, the response of um, Gilbert and Gordon's mothers, particularly Gilbert's mothers, to their relationship. Um, yeah. Can you say a bit more about that and what, was that a surprise um, when you came across it in the letters? Well, I, I think I think the surprise was obviously the big reveal in the letters. Uh, yeah. But what, when you mentioned that I bought a thousand letters, of course, not all of them were from Gordon. We've got letters from Gilbert's mum, from his dad. We've got letters to Gilbert from Gordon's mum. Um, and it's fairly obvious from the letters that um, both mothers are well aware of the relationship. Um, so is Gilbert's um, brother and two sisters. They are aware by the hints that they make. And we, we're pretty sure that Gilbert's dad's aware, but he's one of those that, well, you know, as long as it doesn't happen in front of me, that's fine. And he refers to Gordon as Twinkle. Um, so that, that's his sort of nickname for, for Gordon. So I think if we'd have discovered um, the relationship and then immediately the mother's letters. But because of the way that we uncovered it, bearing in mind, as you said, we didn't get the letters in in date order, mm -hmm. as we uncovered it gradually as we were going forward, it wasn't really a surprise, but it may have been more of a surprise to you um, mm. from the LGBT community mm -hmm. that their mothers were aware of it and, and, and were okay with it and, mm -hmm. and, and supported it than it was for us because we uncovered it as a relationship mm -hmm. Then it became a, a gay relationship. And then it was, well, mum knew about it all along. And of course, mothers are, are, are far more understanding than, 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 than us dads tend to be. <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe. Because I suppose, yes, for me coming, I think at the time you were discovering the Soldiers in Love letters, I was doing a piece about um, the arrest of a lot of gay men in Shrewsbury in 1949. 
Um, so that was, although I tried to find as many positives as I could, it's very much a, you know, a story of persecution, the law, uh, grey, bad, bad times. So it was really refreshing with your story because here were two men who were generally, it seems, having a very good life, having a lot of fun. And not only that, they were not hiding who they were from their families. No, it, it, it's almost like that, that your the story that you told is the is the negative side of how mm. things went. And then we got the other side of it with with Gilbert. Gilbert and Gordon were I mean, I described them as two fun guys living life to the full. Yeah, because that's what they were doing. I mean, uh, Gordon writes to Gilbert and tells him all sorts of uh, things that he's been up to and, and who they've been talking to. He met Stanley Axman. For example, in, in the barracks one day, Gordon did, and Stanley Axman was the choir bow that sang the solo in the film Mr. Chips. So, I mean, all of this information comes out. Uh, yeah. And um, there's one description, I haven't brought the letter with me, but there's a description of when they go to um, a, um, a, a particular pub down in Devon somewhere. And he says, we went on Thursday night because that is the time and day when we all foregather. And then he goes through and he says there were generals too, brigadiers by the handful, and, and sort of makes a, a, a light remark about the fact of how many um, soldiers, including officers, there were there that were gay. So yeah. it, it's, it's really refreshing that they just talk. And as I say, they name names. They don't, there's nothing. They, we don't, haven't yet found anything coded in the letters. It all seems to be just open letters. Yes. And they took an awful risk, as you've said, yeah. writing them yeah. like that, but they must have felt secure enough and, uh, and confident enough to do it. Well, I remember at, <clears throat> when you did your talk, somebody from the audience asked you, well, what about the censor? And you explained, no, because they were here in the UK, not yes. posted abroad, therefore that wasn't a consideration. So maybe they could write much more freely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm thinking, you know, from the point of view of um, our friends from Fighting With Pride who are, um, listening, watching us at the moment, and I'm thinking, my understanding, and I'm sure they may correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was only in the 1950s, 1957, I think, the regulations came in that specifically said you could not be gay and in the forces. Uh, obviously, before then, if you were caught doing anything, then it was criminal law and dishonourable discharge and any medals or the rest of it you had um, got were taken from you. Um, so it, it is still astonishing though, I, I'm still breath, you know, that there are other guys uh, and, and obviously women now too who in the services up until I think 2000 um, just sort of lost everything, lost their pension, lost uh, all the regard that they stood in and it's wonderful that um, this group have managed now to, I think it was in the news last week, um, I don't yeah. know if you picked up on it very much, but the medals now will be returned. But, yes, uh, I did see it. I saw it as a, as a link to, to the story. Uh, and of course, Caroline was, was involved in our Ink to Ash to Diamond. Um, and uh, I've spoken to Caroline on another couple of occasions. And it was very interesting that one of the organisations that reached out to me to go and give a talk about Gilbert and Gordon, because I think that's the strange thing if you like for me strange is a funny word to describe it that I've had all these invitations from all over the the country to go and give talks and tell people about yeah. Gilbert and Gordon and, and one of the organizations that reached out was the Royal British Legion. Right right well that ties in with a question we've just had in from Brian and Kevin who say this is such a wonderful story has there been any interest from TV film producers? Uh, with It's a Sin doing so well, perhaps Russell T. Davis might be interested, question? Yeah, it, it's um, from, the, from the interest point of view, the interest has been very, very widespread. Yeah. Um, we, I, I am, uh, we have a, a Californian film producer who has an option on making a film and a documentary. Uh, and I'm not sure if Andrew would, has joined us tonight because he did say he was hoping to, but that's still ongoing. We're still talking to um, um, uh, Netflix and people like that about doing a documentary, but we've got to be very careful that this is told as the true story and not too much uh, dramatized um, or, or um, Hollywood's angle put on it because the story itself is. 
Um, mm. So interesting. I've been told it's a very difficult story to do because if we had half a dozen letters, they would snap it up and write their own thing and say, well, we'll just include the few bits out of the six letters. Because I've got so many letters, <laughs> they can't put a foot wrong because it would be so easy to say, no, you can't do it. Um, We've had a lot of interest from, I've had two actors. Uh, um, there was a quite a famous actor in South Shropshire called Pete Postlethwaite. Um, one of his relatives who's also an actor in, in um, America has been in touch about the possibility of doing something. I've got, uh, unfortunately, COVID has put everything on hold for the last 12 months. Before COVID, and I'm hoping that we can pick up in a couple of months time, we had uh, uh, an opera composer in London that wanted to write a mini song cycle. We've had actors that want to put stage plays on. I'm still writing the book, but it's a slow progress because obviously I do such a lot of other things as well. Um, the Skipton Building Society, for example, asked me to go up and give a talk on Gilbert and Gordon at their um, uh, day, their, their, I think they called it the coming out day when they were broadcasted to all their branches. Uh, AIUP, a design company in Birmingham, uh, I went down to Brighton to do a pre-Pride talk and in actual fact last year uh, Fern and I and a group of um, supporters from Oswald Street were due to march in Brighton Pride under mm -hmm. the Oswald Street Town Museum banner um, under the Gilbert and Gordon project but unfortunately Covid's put paid to that so I mean that's still on our radar to do so the interest countrywide on, on these two guys stories is still growing and I must still get a dozen emails a week Wow. It's and queries about it. Wow. Wow. And well, obviously, we're still very much alive. Yeah. Well, and obviously, people remember and want to know more because um, a question that's come in is saying, Hi, Mark, you came to speak at my school about Gilbert and Gordon, and it was really inspiring. What would you like young people to take away from the Gilbert and Gordon story? I think for. for I think the young people can take away the fact that, that if the story of Gilbert and Gordon can have an effect on someone like me, um, that, that, that their story is something that can be shared, that can, in, that can encourage people to take part today. For mm. example, when we did the Ink to Ash to Diamond, we had the Marches School design the bunting as mm. to what love meant to them. Um, so we, we worked with the Marches LGBT group. I know of two schools that have set up LGBT groups since the talk because of um, the Gilbert and Gordon. And of course, we did that fantastic presentation at, um, at the uh, Meal Bray School, where we had three sessions with, was it two or three, 400 pupils in each session? And yeah. we talked to the whole school. I've done a school, uh, a talk to the uh, Mary Webb School um, in Ponsbury. Um, and other talks to other groups and other school groups. So I think it's something that it, it's it's um, it's almost like a wedge to open the door. Mm. So that once you start talking and you're talking about something that's historical, but it it tells you social history as well, but also about relationships. So it's 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 quite an easy in for a subject. It's nothing that's um, that that the young people could either be. Um, uh, shy or, or or scared of because it's something that that it's just an easy way to discuss mm, mm, mm. yes that's right and i wonder one of the questions that came in was asking about in a sense what you want to see included in this story because in a, in a way it's almost as if you've got such a wealth of information um and people often when they wouldn't wish to be entertained like things to be kept simple how 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 can you manage that because i think you quite rightly say you don't want it to be just a sort of um superficial hollywood for better you know ways of saying it but yeah. how, how 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 do you deal with that mark well i think i, I think the the basic premise is that the gilden gordon story is a love story and really it's that simple it, it, it doesn't, when I say it doesn't matter that it's same sex, it does obviously, but it doesn't matter from the point of view that it's a love story. So therefore the love story needs to be told. Um, mm. And there are incidentals along the way. And I think the social history story is somewhat removed from that because uh, sort of what dad's growing in the veg patch um, and, and they talk a lot about the bombings in uh, Torbay and Torquay and Bristol. And they mm -hmm. talk about the buildings that were destroyed. I mean, that, that's war history. 
but I think to keep it simple for this this is a this is a a, a love story that's never been told. We've seen the love stories that uh, the Hollywood love stories where one person goes away and um, um, uh, and they're separated by war or one of them is injured or killed or whatever. But we haven't yet seen the story of two people that don't go to the front line, but they are ordinary people living their lives in a very ordinary way, but they just happen to be same sex um, a love story. So we've never seen that story being told. And I think it's a story that, that has a huge amount of merit because it is so ordinary and so everyday. Mm. And that's how people should view it, that it's, it's an everyday thing. It's a fantastic love story. Mm. And yet, uh, I suppose I'm at risk of going back over things, but it wasn't an ordinary everyday thing back in the day when they were around. And I, I remember... Um, one of Gordon's relatives who took part in the whole um, event that happened in Oswestry Street um, put us on to something that his father had um, documented in doing a family history. And this was a bit of a story of when Gordon was, I, you'll correct me, whether it was in Worcestershire or somewhere there, and he'd been involved with a stud farm, a business, and somebody had said, ah, oh, yes, he was of the gay fraternity or something. And it was almost an implication that something had happened and that yeah. maybe that had, yeah. that had precipitated Gordon deciding, yes, I, I will go to California. Can you say any more about that at all? Um, I, I, yeah, I, that's still on our list mm. to, to do a little bit more research into because I'm still at, at the stage where I'm still transcribing the last 200 letters uh, yeah. at the moment. Yeah. But I think that perhaps when I said the, an, an ordinary love story, perhaps I shouldn't have said ordinary every day, but that's how it should be viewed because it was a fantastic love story. It's two people who were in love. They were living their wives under... Uh, traumatic um, times mm. Mm. with the bombings and everything. Mm. Um, Gilbert worked for, for a company that was heavily involved in, in food production and Cadbury's looked after their people very, very well. Mm. Um, and Gordon was, was um, uh, also involved in the army to start with, um, but he was a fantastic racehorse trainer. So they were people from um, very much ordinary backgrounds. I know their families were, were fairly well to do mm -hmm. but you see at the end of the day you've got to look at the fact that Gordon was a racehorse trainer but Gilbert was a rep for Cadbury's mm -hmm. you know they, they were they were quite ordinary people um in that respect yeah um, and they didn't go yeah. abroad and fight but they stayed in this country and Gilbert was in the anti-aircraft yeah. battalions yeah um up guarding the fourth bridge and, yeah. and guarding up in scotland so i think yeah. from that point of view that's what i mean when i say that it was ordinary and we should view it as yeah you know a fly in the flag for the lgbtq yeah. community but yeah. but really it was it's the love story so yeah. keep it simple and yeah. tell the love story i mean i don't know i should have said this earlier really but if anyone from fighting with pride would like to sort of make themselves known um then we can we can sort of spotlight them and have them join the the discussion because yeah. that, that that is so <clears throat> excuse me that's so interesting that um they were able to do that and yet there are so many service personnel who um i think probably both before the war and certainly after and after you know the regulations tightened up um just went through hell really um, and it's such a contrast with this this story that, that that you have discovered. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that uh, because they didn't go abroad, they they weren't affected by the censors, mm. and no doubt if they had gone abroad, they could not have been so open in their letters. Mm. Um, yes. But even so, it's very strange that they that they actually name names. Yes. Of the people that they meet, because uh, if those letters had been discovered. Yeah, um, the, the, they would have been, uh, you know, um, hung, drawn, and quartered. The people that then, that yes. then, quite literally, but they're, they're, they're yeah. named in the letters. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, uh, a question's come in uh, an anonymous one this time, saying, "Do we know more about Gilbert's affair? Um, did he tell Gordon to ask him for forgiveness, or do you think it was because he wanted to break up?" Mm. I, I think the, the problem is that we've got Gordon's letters to Gilbert, 
Mm. But we haven't got Gilbert's letters to Gordon. Mm. So mm. we get a response from Gordon where he says, you told me about James. So he's, he's obviously told him who it is. You told me about James. And then Gordon says the strangest thing. He says, I can understand how he fell in love with you because, after all, I did. Yeah. So, so it's it's almost uh, like an acceptance, and then he goes on to say, "Were you unfaithful um, uh, mentally or physically?" Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, um, the relationship, I think, may have been a little bit rocky at that time because there's a very long winded letter from Gordon where he he rambles an awful lot about reminiscing about their lives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's during the same period. Mm. where he says um, two things. In the one letter where he says, I want you to do one thing for me seriously, I want you to burn all my letters. And obviously he didn't burn Gilbert's because he then uh, about two or three weeks later writes and says, I've been rereading a lot of your letters. Mm. Um, and I think that one day our letters should all be published then the whole world could see how in love we are. Which of course is the, is the, yes. is, is the actual really pinnacle of... of, of uh, the demonstration of love in, in those letters. Yeah, I think Caroline's. Yes, I think we might we might be, if we're lucky, we might be joined by um, Caroline. Yes. Um, can you help us with that, Jade, so that uh, Caroline can step to the step up to the plate, as it were? Hi, we'll Caroline. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, guys. Lovely to see you again. Yeah. Yes, and you? Long time, long time. Yeah, long time no see. It's lovely to hear you, Caroline. I mean, I keep mithering on this point of how different it is, or was, it seems, for Gilbert and Gordon, and yet being aware of, of the horrors that so many service personnel faced and the fight that's still going on. Uh, can you say a bit more, you know, of your involvement in, in changing these things? Yeah, absolutely. I think Craig's in the audience somewhere as well. Um, Craig and I are the joint CEOs, and I think Ali might be uh, with us as well as uh, our vice chair. Uh, so you've got a bit of a fighting with pride team in the <clears throat> in the audience uh, because obviously this really interests us. Um, so fighting with pride um, was set up in only 2020, so um, on the 20th anniversary of the lifting of the ban. Um, and we've had a really busy year. Um, we've, we're have we there to support um, LGBT plus veterans, uh, but also serving personnel and their families. Um, but very quickly, um, we've prioritised on reaching back to pick up the uh, LGBT plus veterans who were dismissed from service or thrown out of service or forced out of service prior to the ban being lifted on the 12th of January in 2000. Um, and... They were treated pretty awfully. Uh, people who had uh, signed up to um, put their lives on the on the front line and defend the country, um, as soon as they were um, discovered to be LGBT plus, it's known as a gay ban, but it was very much um, targeted towards LGBT plus people uh, in general. Um, and there, all sorts of horrible things happened, like um, interrogations, not questioning, interrogations and medical examinations, and they were uh, sent to jail, uh, um, military jail. And you mentioned the law, um, and the law, of course, changed in '67 with the Se Sexual Offences Act. But within the Sexual Offences Act, the military was given dispensation; it was given exemption uh, from uh, from that law, uh, and that was uh, pushed back to 1955, as you say, the 50s. Yeah, 1955, right. Yeah. yeah, and each of the services had their own act. So there's the Air Force Act, there was the Army Act, and the Navy had its uh, act, which was 1957, which was the Navy Discipline Act. And um, there was some horrible witch hunts went on, and there was a, a special investigations team who would, uh, their job was to hunt down uh, LGBT plus people. And uh, they were uh, thrown out and they weren't given any resettlement opportunities, no notice. They went to prison. Uh, some of them were given um, sexual uh, offences on their records, um, wow. even though it had no meaning in UK civil law. It was a, a, it was a military thing, but that went uh, onto their 
uh, records as civilians as well. So they ended up on the uh, criminal uh, lists and things for sexual offences. And so we're, we're trying to get pardons for those kinds of crimes. Uh, we're trying to get reparations for all of the hurt that was uh, done. And as you saw in the news last week, there was the medals um, uh, announcement. That's just the start of it. That's just the beginning of it. Um, and at Fighting with Pride, we're delighted to, we're the only LGBT plus military charity in the country. Uh, and we're working closely with government, with the NHS, with all of the big service charities. Um, and everybody um, is positive. Uh, everybody wants to step up and support. But of course, um, all of these military people, all these veterans have been cast the war off and I, they're all isolated now and dispersed and it's really important that we uh, reach out to them and try to um, uh, re-engage with them and, and let them know that the support is there and people want to help them. Um, and so when listening to uh, Gilbert um, and Gordon and seeing the similarities there. And actually, one of the, the, the people that we're speaking to at the moment who was thrown, he, he had some pretty horrendous treatment, was guarding Rudolf Hess. So there was a link. Uh, when you mentioned Rudolf Hess, Mark, I was thinking, oh, oh there's, a, there's a link here, and it's gone a circle kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, um, really horrible the way that the, the nation treated its military LGBT plus people. But of course, now the services are amazing. They're fully inclusive. People march on pride. They're in the Stonewall uh, Index, Workplace Experience Index. So the forces are brilliant, but the veterans are still kind of been left behind. Yeah, that, that really resonates as well, I think, Caroline, for a few years ago, um, law was brought in that would pardon um, men who were in the position of having committed an offence which since 2003 would no longer be an offence. But of course, these are often older or elderly men uh, dispersed all around the country. So for them to find out and get justice is very difficult. And I think that may be an issue that uh, um, you will have in terms of people thinking, oh, well, you know, as people said, oh, well, you've got a pardon now. Uh, people say, oh, well, they're getting the medals back now. That's only the beginning, isn't it? And thank you for putting up uh, your, your, the website, which is www.fightingwithpride.org.uk. Um, yeah, there's, there's loads of information on there about what we do and who we are, but also there's a contact us. Um, so if you go on there and you want to uh, ask us anything, you can do that through the website. Um, but also if you know of any LGBT plus veterans yeah. um, who might need support or anybody who just wants to know about that part of history, because what we're trying to do is exactly as Mark said, is to get that history um, more widely seen uh, within museums and, uh, and capture it all, because it's a really important part of the history of the military and it's been forgotten. So we need to capture that. Can you yeah. comment on that, Mark, on your experience with the Royal British Legion, perhaps? Sorry, did, was that yeah, to with me? The, with the, yeah, with the, with the British Legion. Are they, are they open? Are you, is the door open there? Well, um, we, we, we're partnered with the British Legion. Uh, great. So, um, yeah, so we have a good relationship with them. Can, Peter, can I and Caroline, can I just make, uh, just I'll tell you a little story of something that happened in the museum, just to show you that although we are uh, uh, and you in particular are making great strides, of course that's with in the UK. Um, but just before lockdown, and I'm not sure if I didn't mention this to you, Peter, in a previous chat, I had a gentleman that ring ring me up and asked me if he could come to the museum. Was the would the museum be open? And in particular, he wanted to see the Gilbert Gordon display. So I said yes. Um, he didn't say where he was coming from, but he actually drove a considerable distance, and he was an American Air Force pilot. And he came to the museum to have a look, and we chatted to him, and he bought some T-shirts, and he thought the project was fantastic. And during the course of chatting to him, he stayed most of the day. Mm. Um, I won't say which area, which sorry, which um, U.S. Air Force base he came from, because uh, of course his worry at the time was that under the um, uh, under the Trump administration, of course he wasn't allowed to uh, to be gay, to be in the American Air Force. And he actually said to me, "Would you be prepared to come to our base 
and give a talk on Gilbert and Gordon. And I said, yeah, no problem. Why don't you put, put it forward? And he said, oh, no, he said, I didn't put it forward. He said, because the minute I put it forward, they'll know that I'm interested in that sort of thing. Could you not contact the base and say that you're going around doing talks and would the base like it as part of an equality and diversity um, campaign? And would the base like you to come? He said, then I can come to the talk, but so will hundreds of others and I'll be safe. Um, and then unfortunately COVID hit. So we haven't, uh, you know, we, we never got around to doing that. Well, under the new administration, we, it, we may be more welcome. But mm -hmm. it's to sort of say that although we're making great strides in this country, there are other countries, supposedly civilized countries, where that aren't making this progress. And that, that so the need uh, for, uh, for us to be an example or a bit of a light, if you like, a shining light, and Caroline, what you're doing, I'm, I'm referring to that then, is obviously still there. And that's just one incident of, of, of many that have come about because people have contacted the museum because of our Gilbert and Gordon display. Yeah, brilliant, really. Um, just to kind of change the key a little bit, because a question came in about... Gilbert and Gordon's families, yeah, um, and whether the relationships, uh, you know, with yourself, the museum doing this work, have been positive or negative. Have there been any developments there, Mark? Um, it, it's almost like um, uh, the tale of two cities because um, Gilbert's um, relatives are, um, I suppose. Uh, they're, they're approaching it from the point of view that this was something very private and that, uh, therefore it shouldn't be publicised, despite the fact that, that um, the letters were bought from his estate, so they technically they sold the letters. They're not 100% um, anti, but they've just made it clear they don't want to be involved and they don't want to, uh, they don't want to be interviewed, they don't want to be quoted. Um, they don't really want to take any part. Whether that will change over time, I don't know. Gordon's family, on the other hand, as you are aware, Peter, are absolutely fully supportive. Mm. Uh, and they actually came, and when we had the ring made from the ashes, well, the ring, by the way, which is now on display in Oswestry Museum, which contains the essence of 800 secret love letters, um, it was Gordon's relatives who came and presented the ring to the museum. And I think that was brilliant. Uh, and, and his um, first cousin and second cousin came and his second cousin made an absolutely fantastic speech, um, if you remember, on the final oh. night. And I think that was absolutely, that was brilliant. Mm. Yeah, and I think you'd endorse that, Caroline, if you're still there, is, is the need for the wider family to support personnel who are going through um, uh, trying to get justice and to, uh, to appreciate what really did happen. Some people, I suppose, will always just not want to know, but uh, that doesn't mean everybody doesn't want to know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I found with the letters, Peter, and I think I've said this and I said it in my podcast, is that the letters, when you start to read the letters, I don't care what your mind frame is when you start, but when you start to read the letters, mm. because you're reading... Uh, possibly because you're reading a story mm. so it's not somebody standing in front of you saying this is what you should believe you find that you actually do want to know more yeah. and the letters have the ability to make people want to know more and want to understand and they want to know what happens next yeah. and i've had i've had groups phone me up to go and give a talk and say can you come and give us a talk on the museum oh and by the way can you make it heavy on the gilbert and gordon story so, I mean, people, people hear about it, they know what the story is about, and they ask me to go and give them a talk. I mean, a thing to reflect on there is the little film at the beginning, From the Ashes to um, Diamond Project, was the elderly woman in the residential home who gives the first letter, her first love letter from her husband, and says, yes, yes, I want you to burn it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm very nervous about doing that. And she was just saying no because we and my husband, we were free to be able to express our love. Yeah. Um, and I understand that until very recently, that's not been possible for so many people. And that was an example, I think, of what you're saying about how the letters touch people. Um, it's really lovely. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had uh, the ring, as I said, is, is the, the centrepiece on display now. Um, and we've had people that took part in that 
uh, project who before lockdown used to come to the museum every week or every month mm -hmm. because their um, their their uh, memories are reunited in that ring mm -hmm. uh, and we've had people that, that who's had partners that have passed who've had children that have passed and they come in because they are reunited with those memories now in that ring in the museum mm -hmm. No, it's really beautiful. And it'll always stay with me in that little picture there in, in, the, in the square by the market hall with the, the, the lady singing in the background and the wind coming across. Yeah. <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely feeling there. Um, now, I don't know. Apologies to you, Caroline, if we have muted you still. Yes, I think we have. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but uh, um, whatever i'd just like to say thank you so much for for uh, popping in and, and saying what you had to say and, and good luck uh very best of luck with what you're doing mark really we, i'm just looking at the time and we're sort of edging up toward um eight o'clock now is there anything else that you would like to say or or, or just uh, where where next with this what are you focusing on and what about the film is it going to happen do you think well, we, we, we think the, the, the film we're still working away at. We think what might be more likely is that there might be a, a, an actual factual documentary, uh, a two or three part documentary on their lives done first. I'm three chapters into the book uh -huh. um, and I, I'm, I'm beavering away. But of course, I do a lot of other bits and pieces as well. Uh, and where next? Well, who knows? Because the story keeps growing. I keep getting different people. I mean, it was I, uh, it was quite a, a surrealistic uh, point for me to travel down to Brighton to give a pre-Pride talk. Mm -hmm. um, but then from that, who knows? Uh, Oswestry Museum featuring in Brighton Pride next year, um, which is... Uh, and when I came back and put it on the museum Facebook page, that that's what we were thinking of doing, I had about a dozen people who came straight on and said, yeah. I'll come with you. So it, it's not, you know, and I think you know that when we did the Ink to Ash to Diamond project, the whole of Oswestry embraced it. Yes. I mean, the people in the cafe wore Gilbert and Gordon T-shirts, yeah. the people in the library, the people in the bookshop. Um, and it was something that got, really got people talking. And I think yeah. that, that where next? Well, we need to keep the story alive yeah. because that will allow other people to tell their stories. Yeah. And as we started off with in the beginning, if you've got people, young people um, or older people who have got stories that they think they would like to tell, come and tell us. I mean, mm. if it's to do with Oswestry, if it's not to do with Oswestry, then we can perhaps feature it in the, in the wider scheme. Um, but we want the stories to be told, and we're quite happy to display them in Oswestry Street and to and yeah. to feature them on our, our on our new website, which hopefully will go live in about three weeks' time. Yeah. Oh, lovely! I was going to ask you that. So that is going to be a real good resource for people to come to, especially in these times, and hopefully they won't come back again, where people yeah. can't physically actually come and see those wonderful letters, the actual things. It's very moving. So that's fantastic. And I think what you were saying about going on Brighton Pride is brilliant because um, people have said among the, uh, you know, the kind of history festival movers and shakers, how for museums, galleries, etc. to take this on, how important it is that very positively people right at the top of the organisations are out there showing their support. And yeah. that's exactly what you're doing, Mark. Well, you've got to remember that the, the, the Ink to Astra Diamond project was one of four projects that mm. the National Trust supported. So you know, that was a massive organisation that yeah. supported us with that. Yeah. And we, okay. still, we still feature it in Heritage Open Days every year on, in a September, other than last year, of course, when we couldn't do it. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So any last words, Mark? Or I think we've probably covered it. There are no more questions coming in. So I'll uh, leave you the only to one... last word before I, I do a quick finish off okay the only one, one other thing that i would make is an awful lot of people contact me saying can they come and see the letters mm -hmm. at this moment in time um no they can't because i'm still transcribing them so they're not um fully transcribed what i am doing by the way is when i transcribe a letter if it describes a show that gilbert or gordon go to see or gordon and one of uh, gilbert's sisters because he took the sisters out a lot go to a theater i try to buy a program from that show from that theater so that i've got that as well so once they're done then 
Um, my intention in the end is that all of these letters should be digitized and made available to everyone. But uh, obviously that's, that's in, the, in the distance at the moment. Yeah. But that is part of the project. Wonderful. I mean, that could be extremely expensive, I guess, though. Uh, it could be, but I've been told that yeah. there are a couple of organizations that would support us with that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, there is one just last question come in, which is I recall the people seeking asylum. Oh, yes, who came to the celebration in the um, uh, Ashtadam. And yes, do you remember that? Oh, the tea dance. They came to the tea dance. They came they, up. Uh, they, just just they say a little bit about that. What was that? Right. Well, they brought uh, um, uh, Olivia Winteringham, organised for a busload of LGBT asylum seekers from Birmingham, the Birmingham area, to come down to our tea dance. Um, and we had some fantastic comments from them. They said that the, it was the most relaxed they'd been. They couldn't understand really how Oswestry accepted them. Mm -hmm. And they came to this wonderful um, tea dance that we put on where there were people from all walks of life. Um, and it, it wasn't a sort of an us and them. It wasn't a, well, the gay people go in that room and, and the heterosexual people go in another room. We all mixed, we all danced, yeah. we all talked. It yeah. was an absolutely fantastic event. Yeah. If you ever wanted to, to demonstrate, I think, or to talk about an event um, uh, that, that uh, where equality and diversity were absolutely were yeah. there naturally yeah. and not yeah, forced. Yeah. It wasn't people pretending were there naturally i think that is the event to talk yeah. about um, and, it, and again we want to invite them down again wonderful because that was in a way that was a very neat sort of reflection back i mean i know we don't know for sure whether why gordon went to ultimately to california he may have just gone anyway because that was a good place to do his stud horse business but there were many many gay men who did leave england in a sense looking for asylum back in the dark days of the 40s and 50s. Yeah, um, of course, Gordon. We have other people coming from other countries coming to the UK seeking asylum. Yeah, of course, Gordon didn't go alone to California because he formed a relationship, right. both business and personal, with Eric Micklewood, who was an actor, and the two of them went across to California. Yes, yes thank you. Thank yeah, you so. Much. Yeah, yeah, no, I remember that. Well, that was fantastic, as I knew it would be. Thank you. You should have some sort of... Um, award as a, a an ally mark um, and i remember you saying something about your daughter saying it was unbelievable that her dad was walking around you know gay rights sort of thing and wouldn't believe we're sort of pulling your leg really but it's been I, an unbelievable experience yeah. it's been do you know what it's been great fun doing it and continuing to do it yeah